What's up, everybody? And happy Saturday. We don't get to do a ton of Saturday morning lives, but here we are. And we're talking about James Crumbly's trial day two. Some really interesting stuff that I think you guys are going to enjoy about the lawyering and how I feel about this defense lawyer versus Jennifer Crumbly's defense lawyer. I guess they've worked together or were partners or something. I think they've worked together on cases in the past. We're going to compare and contrast them a little bit. Um, I think she showed a lot of her style yesterday in court. Um, a lot of speaking objections by the prosecution. They are basically acting the same as they did during Jennifer Crumbly's trial. So we get a pretty good comparison about how the lawyers may differ from each other and stylistically and how they handle the case and how they handle those speaking objections. So we're going to go through all of that. And then later today, I'm recording a video um, about... There's a, something on my desk. Um, I'm recording a video about Hannah Gutierrez's lawyer gave a short interview that has so much interesting information in it. He talks about appeal. He talks about the things that went wrong during trial. We're going to compare and contrast some things, show some clips about what he's talking about, talk about where maybe he might have made a mistake and maybe there was something that was out of his control that we didn't get to watch together. So we're going to talk about all that. I'll probably post at some point tomorrow. Um, but go ahead and hit that like button if you guys haven't already. Make sure you subscribe and hit that reminder bell so that you get reminded whenever we post new videos. Schedule next week, my kids' spring break, so it's going to be a little bit different, a little bit off. We're traveling for part of the week, so we'll still be popping in. We'll still be doing live. We'll still be talking crumbly and other stuff as it happens. Uh, but I appreciate everybody that always joins in on these lives. It's so much fun to hang out together, talk about these cases, see what we can learn. Um, I've gotten some questions just in my normal life about these cases as well with all these involuntary manslaughter and not really necessarily the trigger people um, getting charged and you know two for two convicted so far with Jennifer Crumbly and Hannah Gutierrez. We'll see if um, James Crumley becomes three. And then Alec Baldwin was the quote unquote trigger man, whether or not he pulled the trigger, but the one holding the weapon, but still unintentional killing. And we're going to talk more about that in the next video. Um, when we kind of focus on Hannah Gutierrez reads lawyers, um, interview. Some people are saying I'm quiet and that's probably true because I am going to play this video. I have the, the audio boosted on it. So hopefully it normalizes when we play the video. If you need me to turn up my volume, as we're watching the video, just let me know and I will do that as well. We're just trying to work with courtroom feeds that are imperfect and I have the audio boosted through um, through my website here. So I guess I can turn it up for now. Let me turn it up here. Get ready, everybody. I'm going to turn up my volume. All right. Everybody get their headphones adjusted accordingly. All right. So... Let's talk about day two, and then when I bring the video up, I will drop my volume a bit. Um, so we started with the cross-examination of the officer that finished the day testifying um, day one, and we here's where we get to see the style of cross for this defense attorney. And I will say, I love this style of cross. She has very specific points she wants to make, and she exudes confidence in the way that she does it. How does one exude confidence in these situations? Well, I'll pull up the feed here just so you can get kind of a visual as I'm talking about it. She is standing at counsel table, which is appropriate in this judge's courtroom. And as long as the judge is okay with it, everybody else should be okay with it too. She has a pen in her hand and on counsel table, she has a couple things. She has some kind of outline that she has made and she has a binder full of exhibits. So what does she do as she asks this officer questions? Well, she says, in exhibit X, that's what this is saying, right? She pulls the exhibit out and then puts it to the side. In exhibit Y, this is what it's saying, right? And then she puts it to the side. Referencing specific exhibits gives you credibility with the jury, that you're not afraid of the exhibits, that some of the exhibits could be good for you, and that the officer can't argue with you. Then she references specific text messages. This text message says this. That text message says this. And as she goes, she checks off things. She's using that pen in her hand. She's checking things off as she goes to show the jury, look at all the points I'm making. I like that. She doesn't argue with the witness. She's very nice. If the witness isn't sure, she says, that's okay. Let's move on to the next one. She deals with objections appropriately in my, in my opinion. And I think she's doing a good job. Let's talk about some of the points she's making. 
The most important point to me, uh, Eden said, I like that she talks fast. Yeah, Eden, we're going to listen to some and I don't have it on 1.5 speed because I do think she talks fast enough that's kind of perfect for us to work through it. Some people are saying she talks too fast. I like the way that she talks fast, but I'm kind of a fast talker too. So, all right. The biggest point she makes, which I think is one of the most important points in the trial the jury has to figure out is, you don't know if James knew blank. And a lot of those things. You don't know if James knew that Ethan had the weapon, had access to the weapon, was at the house. We know James was at the house when Ethan was making those videos, but we don't know if he was in the same room. We don't know if he heard it. We don't know if he knew about it. We don't know if he said okay. You don't know if Ethan's telling the truth in his texts. And the officer would try to throw things in like, well, why would he lie? It makes no sense. Why would he lie to his friend? Pretty sure teenagers lie to their friends about a lot of things, whether it's to get attention, to be dramatic, to sound cool. I'm not saying that's what Ethan's doing, but just generally speaking, I think sometimes teenagers exaggerate to be like, yeah, I threw for 400 yards in my football game today to their friend that doesn't live there and doesn't know it was only 250. Just making that up. Uh, Annalie said, think of the court reporter. Usually court reporters are not shy about telling lawyers to slow down. I've had court reporters tell me before, but I've also had court reporters tell me, I love how you project your voice. It is so much easier to hear you than some other people in the courtroom. So, you know, there's some give and take with stylistic differences between lawyers. Um, another good point that she brought up is in the text exchange between James Crumbly and the friend's dad, he never said he was worried about Ethan Crumbly. He never said, oh no, now that your son is gone, I'm really worried about Ethan. Ethan sounds really depressed. Kind of getting into the mind of James Crumbly at that time. And then she also gets into some of these little discussions that I think are totally appropriate that can change the way a jury views the case when she talks about deleting things off of your phone. I thought it was an interesting um, angle that she took here. Um, I'm going to turn myself down now a little bit. Hopefully all this still works okay, but John can keep me posted on the side here. All right, so let's play a little bit of this and see some of the interaction and the inappropriate speaking objections by the state and how she kind of works through her list and then also clear that cache so that whatever you're deleting is permanently erased from your phone, right? It's possible, yes. And if that happens, then you wouldn't have found anything in the cache data, correct? Probably not, correct. So it, it's fair to say that deleting a screenshot or, or a message is not necessarily, there's nothing wrong with it, right? There's, again, speculation, <laughs> bless you, speculation, is, that's, that kind of question is for the jury to answer. Well, Your Honor, what I'm asking is if just deleting a message is wrong. Well, you mean morally, legally, professionally, politically? All of them? He's he's here to testify as to what he was able to extract from, from the devices. You'd be asking him to clean it. So wouldn't you be asking him oh, I get where she's going with this. And to me, uh, her argument, the judge makes the right decision in saying, no, he can't speculate on why other people um, delete things. And that's correct. But I, I do think that you can say in your experience, when you do these com computer cases and you do these forensic polls from phones and you see that people delete things, is it always that they're trying to destroy evidence? That's an appropriate question to me and he should be able to answer that. I mean, he said he himself deletes things and he doesn't do it because he's doing anything wrong, trying to hide anything. Right. I mean, that's an inappropriate response by her repeating his testimony to the judge and open in front of the jury, summarizing and saying, he says he deletes things all the time. Now that she said that, she signed kind of okay to move on because she's made her point in front of the jury. Counsel's, or uh, the witness was responding to counsel's question in a conversational tone. He's not, he can't provide opinions on why somebody might delete things or why not. He yeah, can testify who's deleted. Thank you, Judge. In this instance, you did not... So again, she kind of got her point across there. So she moves on to the next thing. Um, she also talks about there's nothing illegal or improper about taking a child to the gun range and she checks it off. Um, nothing wrong with leaving your son at home while you go to work at DoorDash. Nothing wrong with working at DoorDash, things like that. Then we get into redirect. And this prosecutor so often on redirect leads. Lead, lead, leading question, leading question, leading question, leading question. And we're going to get into another kind of battle they have with objections and speaking responses and speaking objections and things like that. Well, hundreds of them, yes. Okay. You know, there's 1,700 students at Oxford High School. I did not know that, but 
leading question, putting an answer in the, in the witness's mouth, something he didn't even know. But now the jury knows it because the lawyer just testified to it. It's a big school. From what you saw there, the scene that you saw when you pulled up in that white minivan you told us about, and you saw the school buses with kids looking for parents. Your Honor, I'm going to object. The prosecution's testifying. Yes, he is. I'll get to the question. Yeah, okay. Okay. Please. Did it seem like it was that number of students at Oxford High School? Paint us a picture of what you saw when you got there. Again, I would also object to relevance about what he saw when he got to the Meyer, Your Honor. It's important because. Council made a point in her cross-examination to suggest that there's no reason for James Crumley to go home. And I think this witness has established yesterday and today that James Crumley was actually at the location where everybody else was going to. So it's important. Prosecutor just literally testifying, summarizing his arguments in front of the jury to argue objections. It's just not how it's supposed to go. This is not how the evidence is supposed to come in front of the jury. Because yes, we can say what the lawyers say is not evidence all we want. But as the lawyers just summarizing testimony while witnesses are on the stand, it's inappropriate. This is stuff that needs to happen at side, sidebar. For the jury to understand what he was observing when he sped from Pontiac to that location. Your Honor, I don't understand what Mr. Wagorowski observed at the Meyer is relevant to whether or not James Crumbly felt that he needed to go home. I, I, I don't know how the two are connected, Your Honor. I, I'm, I, I lost myself. I, maybe I missed something. Okay. And then, frankly, even though the prosecutor is doing these speaking objections, when the judge says something like, I'm at a loss myself, clearly saying like the prosecutor is not making a very good argument, he's wrong. That's not good in front of the jury either. You don't want to make either lawyer look bad. People are saying they like this witness. He was a great witness, I thought. And we're going to talk about what happens on recross and how he, he kind of gets her a little bit. So do you know, all the other parents you saw, do they leave or do they stay? They stay. Thank you. I think that's right. So on recross, where she gets asked another question, she's like, you don't know what kind of doctor Ethan was asking for? And it's like, that's true. He goes, but he was saying he was hearing voices and seeing things. So I kind of surmised what doctor he was looking for. So he was really smart. He didn't try to overstep. He didn't try to make arguments with her. I thought he did a good job, even though, again, I thought the defense attorney got some good points across, which good witnesses, you're still going to get good points across because they're going to be honest and they're going to give you what's true. And the jury's going to have to analyze it and put it all together. Love dropping. 50 lawyer you know memberships. Make sure you have that turned on because 50 of you are going to be new lawyer you know members today. Thank you so much, love, for once again spreading the love. Um, next is a crime scene investigator. Again, they mostly talked about what happened at the scene, so we're not going to dig through that too much. Uh, but then the next witness was the um, person who sold James Crumbly the firearm that was used here. She had sold him other firearms as well, and she kind of talked about what happened when James Crumbly and Ethan Crumbly came and how they had their eye on that weapon, and they end up buying it together. But I thought the cross of this witness was really good, and I, I thought that the credibility of this witness started to wane a little for me as they continued, and even the, even the prosecutor was like, oh, no, she shouldn't testify to that. It's like, you guys called her for this reason, and if she's selling firearms to people, I feel like she should be able to answer some of these questions that they're saying she can't answer. So we're going to listen to some of that cross together now. Necessarily in connection yes. with this case, but as yes. part of your employment. Yes. And in general, it's, it's unlawful for a minor to possess a firearm. Is that correct? Yes. There are certain circumstances where it is not unlawful, correct? Correct. And specifically 18 USC 922 X, Sub three, sub A, sub I, which is in that pamphlet, says that a minor can- She is quoting a very specific statute, and it's in the pamphlet that this lady has people sign when they buy firearms. Temporarily possess a handgun under certain conditions. Do you so know that? I'm just going to object to the form of the question to this witness. We do have a special agent from the ATF testifying later in this trial. I don't think this witness is equipped to testify to that. the content of the pamphlet, only that it was actually given to well, the, the pamphlet is an, is an evidence. Right? It, it will be. It's not yet, yeah, but it will be. Okay. So, well, I mean, I get you, she, have you seen that excerpt in that pamphlet? In that, I mean, that? not all the numbers. I mean, I couldn't recall all the. I mean, asking Ms. Back to recall the specific site from the <laughs> United States code is. is so now we have everybody just having a conversation in open court. The judge is like, well, have you seen this pamphlet? She's like, I mean, I've seen it, but all these numbers, like this is the pamphlet you give out. I don't know if she has them signed and I said she hasn't signed it, but this is what she gives out. You should probably know 
What's in the pamphlet that you give out if you're selling firearms, deadly weapons to people? Then the state's like, see, judge, she's not really sure. She doesn't know what's in here. I think it's totally appropriate to cross her and be, and her, for her to say, I have no clue. I don't even read or look at what's in there. I think that's appropriate. Now, how much weight does that carry? She's not law enforcement. She's not on trial. But I think it just diminishes her credibility a little bit as a witness and as far as you know, what she saw that Ethan was there, that he was interested in this firearms. Like, well, you don't even know what's legal and illegal about minors possessing firearms or how this process is supposed to go, even though it's in your pamphlet. It's in that pamphlet. No. I mean, that. not all the numbers. I mean, I couldn't recall all the... I mean, asking Ms. Beck to recall the specific site from the <laughs> United States Code is, is a little bit <laughs> difficult for her. We're not asking her to just cite the United States Code. It's specifically in her pamphlet. I'll ask you for the content, then, Your Honor. I was trying to be complete in my question, but I'll, I'll just ask her if she recalls the content. You I was just trying to be complete in my question. And you can tell this defense attorney likes to be complete in her question. She cites specific U.S. code. She cites exhibit numbers. She cites timestamps. That's something that really could have helped the Rust defense attorney. And to me, it adds so much credibility. You know that that pamphlet directs that if a minor can temporarily possess a handgun under certain conditions, correct? Are you familiar with that part of the pamphlet? She's sorry, read that. Yes, that a minor can temporarily possess a handgun under certain conditions. Yes. So now what she's done, what this defense attorney has done, and you can notice it as witnesses kind of get up far along with her and cross. Once you do that, once you cite exhibit numbers, timestamps, specific U.S. code, and, you, and she tells you it's in your pamphlet, now you don't really want to argue with her. If she says it says minors can temporary, temporarily possess a firearm, you probably don't want to argue with her because she knows your pamphlet better than you. And that's what you should do as a defense attorney. Maybe I'm giving her too much credit. It's early in the trial. But these are the vibes I'm picking up from this defense attorney as we're starting to go through things. Does that mean she's going to win? No, I don't know if she's going to win or not. But to me, I think that that puts a lot of pressure on the witness. And they're going to think twice before arguing with you. Included in that is target practice, correct? Yes. So again, now the jury knows the U.S. code says a minor can possess the handgun uh, during target practice at a shooting range, which the prosecutor's not outright condemning that the Crumbleys did that, but it's definitely something they wouldn't mind if the jury inferred. To your knowledge, and this is just your knowledge, I'm not asking you about anything that you may know about anything after they left the store. But while they were in the store, to your knowledge, you never saw Mr. Crumbly allow to allow his son to possess that Sig Sauer without his permission. No. Or his supervision. No. Based on your knowledge of the law, and this is just your knowledge of the law, it is not illegal for Mr. Crumbly to allow his son to use that Sig Sauer or any handgun at a, at a shooting range. No. Um, or for Mr. Crumbly's son to handle the firearm while at home if Mr. Crumbly is supervising him. As a object to the form of the question, is she's talking about... That's two different things. Yeah. So, well, you, you can't ask her if it's legal or illegal, but you can ask her if she's familiar with what was in the pamphlet. If that's in the pamphlet, she's familiar with it, she can testify. Correct, Your Honor. That, that was a continued question of based on your knowledge of the law. I'm asking her about her knowledge. Okay. Now I'm going to object to the relevance, Judge. She's an office manager for the store that sold the firearm. Asking her what her knowledge of the law is is, is not appropriate, Judge. It's an improper question. Yeah. You know, what is it? What is it? Her knowledge of that law. Why, why is that relevant? Well? The point is, so so a couple things. Number one, he's she's not asking her like about DUI law or about constitutional law. She's just asking her about firearms laws and laws that apply directly to what she is and and who she is and what she does. And she can say I don't know, and that's perfectly fine. But the reason it's relevant is all these people that work around guns know it's perfectly fine for you to take your 15 year old to the shooting range and teach him how to shoot target practice. She should know that. And the jury should know that because the state has brought it up in arguments and shown pictures of it. It's totally relevant. I would think that as somebody who's an office manager of a firearm store, that she would have knowledge of firearms laws. Okay, but, but she might, but she might, but why is it relevant to these proceedings? I think you have an ATF guy, right? I can ask him as well, Josh. Okay. Yeah. Her, her knowledge it, her knowledge of the pamphlet, because she reviewed it and gave it to Mr. Crumley, um, would be relevant, but I don't think her knowledge of the law is relevant to these proceedings. Thank you, Judge. Regarding the trigger lock statement. And then the old thank you, Judge, when you win an objection. 
That was now we get into the trigger lock. You had a few of them, but we'll look at exhibit 40. <laughs> exhibit 40 is the trigger lock statement. This was the one specifically from November 26th of 2021, correct? Yes. The trigger lock statement simply in, in bold, right above purchaser dealer, in bold, that statement indicates that signing of that form just shows that that sale was done in compliance with the law, correct? Yes. That a cable lock or a locking box or a storage box was provided, correct? Yes. There's nothing on there that's an acknowledgement that, that the purchaser is going to use the cable lock, correct? Correct. There's nothing directing that the purchaser has to use the cable lock. Is that correct? Correct. There's nothing. I mean, I, I think he should have. I wish he would have. Um, whether or not it's due care to use the cable lock is a question for the jury, but is it a mandate? Is it illegal to not use the trigger lock? Absolutely not. And that's what she's getting across here. Nothing here says you have to use it. Nothing here says you have to do this or do that. And I think she's making a good point. Now that might not carry the day. Cause like I said, the jury can discuss whether or not it's due care. A reasonable person would have used the trigger lock. And the fact that he didn't was the cause, um, the likely cause of death, and that's what happened in this case, then fine, that's totally appropriate as well. But I think she's making some good points here. We, we got to realize, this is the case she has. It's not a perfect case. She's got to do the best with what she has. Nothing on that form indicating that you are required to do anything as the dealer other than provide the cable lock, the trigger lock, or the case, correct? Correct. Right. In fact, in November of 2021, there were no laws governing whether somebody had to use a cable lock or a case or a, a safe or anything like that, if you know. Judge, relevance. There's no relevance to this proceeding. If she knows, Your Honor. It's not, it's not just personal knowledge, it's relevant. Are you asking her if she knew of any law? Correct, Your Honor. Well, I, I do know that everybody's familiar with anything like that. Do you know of any laws? And I mean, how is that not relevant? Because if she does know of a law that says you have to do this, she should tell the jury it's very relevant if he broke a law. And if he didn't, that's also relevant. Thank you. Exhibit 36, which is the... Now they're both doing it. Firearm transaction record. I believe this was for the Caltech. You indicated on direct examination that uh, Mr. Crumbly did not receive the firearm the same day that he purchased the firearm, the Caltech. Correct. And this is the firearm transaction record. This is page two of that form, correct? So a couple of interesting questions coming out here. Um, Whitney says, is there any way to bring in the wife's testimony without the wife? Yeah, there are ways. It's difficult and it's really touchy, but maybe to impeach somebody. Um they're, they're getting her statements out on video and text message, some other ways, but her actual testimony in court's tough, maybe to impeach somebody potentially. Kelly D. So Peter, how do you compare this lawyer to Jennifer's? Um, I thought it was obvious and kind of some of my comments. I prefer this type of lawyering to Jennifer Crumbly's attorney. Um, Deb N said, is the witness wearing a lawyer, you know, tie dye shirt. That's funny. Melissa makes a good point. I've never had to be told to lock up my firearms. It's being a responsible gun owner. And that's fine. And this is the type of stuff I think the jury is going to discuss. Um, CB said, I've liked her lawyering style too, Peter. Do you think she's letting the state prove the defendant's guilt and highlighting the areas of doubt? I don't think she's letting the state prove the defendant's guilt. I think that's the state's job. Um, and I think she's doing her best to highlight the areas of doubt and also the ways that they're not proving necessarily even what they're saying they're proving. Class act duty. Both trials have bothered me to my core. I have a 15 year old son and he is definitely not telling me his feelings. It's like pulling teeth just to ask him about his day at school and teenagers do lie. And I think that that's something when we looked at, you know, who might end up on this jury, I think a lot of them would agree with you that their teenagers aren't just forthcoming with all of their feelings and everything that they're doing and thinking at all times. Um, all right. The next witness is a special investigator. They played the interview with the crumbly parents. Camera cut out a few times. We're not going to listen to a ton of it. Audio is not great. But um, James said he tried to get uh, to the high school but couldn't because so much has been made about 
you know, like, did he go this way? Did he go that way? Um, they thought he was the perfect kid. They didn't think there were a lot of issues with Ethan. He said he did have the the firearm in an arm in an armoire, and the bullets were hide, hidden somewhere else under the jeans. Doesn't necessarily know, mean Ethan couldn't have gone to both places, but that was a big deal to the other jury. It's like, where was the firearm at the end? How did Ethan get it? It's like, well, maybe he knew where his dad hid it, even though it wasn't locked in a lockbox. It was in an armoire, and the bullets were somewhere else, but Ethan must have known, and that's how he got it. And, and if she was asking questions about the interview, this is something I love. She had a timestamp for every question she asked. At 1823, he said this. At 1926, he said this. At 20 minutes and one second, he said this. That's confident. That makes impeachment easy, and that lets the witness know, you have studied this. You know where this stuff is. Um, and we'll get to some of the bickering here between the lawyers, of speaking objections, issues, you know, not great, but let me see, where is that? 423 here. Objection to that question, obviously, Judge. That is blanket speculation. James learning that his son was the shooter appeared to be very unexpected to him. Objection to that question, obviously, Judge. That is blanket speculation. Did he seem surprised is, is not speculation. I mean, did he seem surprised? Like you're allowed to testify to what you see, what you observe, what you think based on that. And was he surprised is absolutely inappropriate question in my mind, right? I can understand how somebody may differ, but I don't like how he objects, obviously. Objection, judge, obviously. It's like, come on, man. Come on. Yeah, he, 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 he's trying to speculate about how he was right? I mean, I, I, did he seem surprised is an appropriate question. I'm not sure exactly how she asked it. Was he surprised? I don't know what's going through his mind. To your perception, did he seem surprised? Like in DUI trials, how was the person acting? Or in a car accident case, how did they act after? Did they seem like they were injured? No, they were perfectly found bouncing around. Or yes, they were, their head was resting on the steering wheel. They were out cold. What did you base your observations on? You can ask those questions. That is a clearly improper question. Then, after he wins the uh, the objection, he says this is a clearly improper question to throw some shade at the defense attorney in front of the jury. Like she knows a question is improper and asked it anyway. It's just that's not supposed to be that's not supposed to be the way we do it here as lawyers. Yeah, it's not system. Thank you, Judge. No further questions, Your Honor. Then the judge says, yeah. It's a clearly improper question. Yeah, sustained. And now we're going to hear some other clearly improperly formed questions, not necessarily improper questions, but the way that they're asked here on redirect, a lot of leading. Uh, real quick, Sergeant, let's talk about what James Crimley didn't tell you. He never told you that he bought... Testifying, let's talk about what James Crumley never told you. Not supposed to have a wind-up to your questions. The murder weapon four days ago, did he? He did not. He never said... He never told you that he... Leading questions here. Think of leading on your brain and tell me if any of these are leading. He bought the murder. Sergeant, let's talk about what James Crumley didn't tell you. He never told you that he bought the murder weapon four days ago, did he? He did not. He never said he bought the murder weapon four days ago as a gift for his son. He did not. He never told you the gun was ever locked up, did he? He did not. He never told you the counselor told James and Jennifer Crumley to take their son home that day, did he? No, he did not. Okay. In fact, he referred to it as doodly on the paper, right? Correct. He never actually mentioned that he actually had another son, too. No. Um, in that, that portion of the video where he said, I love you, I love you, I love you, what was his son doing at that time? Talking to, trying to talk to his mom. Okay, and his son was there. So now he's going to kind of transition into the only reason James Crumley was saying I love you so loud was to try and stop Ethan from confessing, I think. That's what he's trying to get the jury to infer, which is interesting. So we'll listen to that here. He was actually saying, I did it at that point. He did. So James was yelling, I love you, I love you, I love you, louder, louder, and louder, over his son. Your Honor, I, I don't know what the implication is that the prosecution is trying to make, but I, I don't think that's even a proper well, well, question. Counsel clearly tried to paint a picture that... He was saying, I love you to his son. And the video depicts something else, so I would like some context. Okay. Your Honor, 
counsel's trying to say the video depicts him saying, I love you to his son, but the video says something different. So he's testifying now that the video doesn't say what defense counsel says. It's up to the jury to decide what the video says. I'm going to back it up so we can listen to it again. Make, but I, I don't think that's even the well, proper well, counsel, counsel clearly tried to paint a picture that he was saying, I love you to his son. And the video depicts something else. So I would like some context. Okay. Your Honor, I think that he's trying to talk over his son's as a That's he's fine. Determined. Um, he's able to say, was he saying it at the same contemporaneous with his son saying, I did it. I did it. And in, in his opinion, did it get louder? But uh, why he was saying it's up to the jury. That's, that's fair, Judge. Thank you. Did he say it at the same time his son was confessing to a crime? He was. Okay. And did his voice elevate, get louder? It did. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, they did retain him an attorney, though, did they? Not that I have no, no knowledge of, no. Okay. Did not. And James Crumley actually did ask, did say to, to stop questioning, too. Yes. Okay. Thank you. No, go ahead. Anything? Uh, Azam asked an interesting question. Peter, dumb question. I've, it's interesting, not dumb. I've been meaning to ask, when you say gavel to gavel, when exactly does the gavel begin and end before jury selection or before the trial starts, after a verdict or after sentencing? So most judges don't even use the gavel ever. Um, we just mean beginning to end of trial. If anything, they hammer it when it's order in the court, when they need to get people's attention. Sometimes judges will hit it at the end. I don't think I've ever had a trial where the judge has started the trial with the gavel. So it is funny to bring that up. Uh, Jessica said, didn't James claim the gun was locked up though? How could it have been locked in the only lock was in the original packaging? The gun case didn't have a lock in it. I don't remember him saying that yet. Maybe that'll come out in a little bit. Bodhi, Peter, there are never sanctions or anything when lawyers lead like that. So why wouldn't they keep doing it? So it's a good question. It's kind of like, why would a golfer ever call a penalty stroke on himself if nobody's going to see it and it doesn't matter? It is a profession of ethics. There is a code. Lawyers can get sanctioned if somebody sees something obvious in a trial like this. It's probably not going to be for asking leading questions, but we should all want to do our job the right way. I get that not all lawyers work with ethics and professionalism like that, but it's beat into our heads. There we're constantly taking CLEs, continuing legal education on it. It's the right thing to do. It's what we should do. We should be held to a higher standard and we should do it the right way. And we should be embarrassed when we don't do it the right way. I know you're probably not going to love that answer, but it's the best one I've got. Tangling with Gina said, bottom line for me is the math paper. I do think it's probably the single most um, damning piece of evidence that they have, especially that he drew the gun. He drew the specific one that they had. No, Your Honor. All right, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Ms. Gibson Marshall, she's in the hallway. Okay. Um, the next witness is the assistant principal. And to me, this was really interesting evidence in Jennifer Crumbly's case as well that obviously didn't carry the day, but I thought we would listen to it again now, which she was one that, you know, like had some cojones and standing up and not hiding and trying to help kids that she saw, but she ended up seeing Ethan Crumbly walking through the hallway with the firearm while he's literally shooting people. And she has the guts to go help a student um, who was fatally wounded but her comments about what she thought immediately when she saw Ethan Crumbly were really, really interesting to me. Looking away down, well, face down, his head was more turned towards the opposite of where I was. Um, so when so I, away from me. Away from okay. me. And there was a garbage can in the way, so I moved the garbage can out of the way so I could get to him um, better. Um, and, and Chrissy, when you approached the student, did you have... Any, could you see any signs of injury? Did you know what happened to the student? Were you? I didn't know anything at that point, no. Okay, what did you do next? I looked up the hallway and I could see another student um, look like he was bringing his arm down. Um, my assumption was that that was probably the shooter. Um, and so what did you do? Uh, I let the office know in Milwaukee that I had eyes on the shooter. Okay. And were you instructed to do anything at that point? I, I don't remember. Would it have mattered? Probably not. Okay. I had a student on my feet. Okay. Tell us about 
Tell the jury what you did. Um, the the shooter was coming closer to me. As he got very close, I realized it was Ethan, and I it didn't seem right to me because Ethan always seemed like a sweet kid. I just couldn't picture that being him, so I talked to him. So Salty Salty Beach Girl said he, she'd known him since fourth grade and and didn't know that it was him, and he was always sweet, and it was really surprising to her. Does she know him as well as his, as his parents? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But specifically for foreseeability, the result has to be foreseeable. Was this foreseeable with Ethan Crumbly? This is at least a neutral third party saying this was not foreseeable. Will it carry the day? Probably not. Um, as he walked by, I asked him if he was okay, what was going on. Um, I took a few steps down the hallway with him. Did you see that he was holding anything? Yeah, he had a gun in his hand. Okay. So again, and then she goes into more of kind of the details that we don't really need to get into for, for our purposes here. So to me, it's it's a really interesting part of the trial. Sherry M, great point. Question, I thought you can lead on cross. You can lead, is that right? Absolutely. You should lead. You absolutely should lead in cross-examination. So whenever I'm complaining or saying somebody shouldn't be leading or that's an inappropriate question, they're not on cross. They're either on direct or redirect. I expect it and and um, think that it should happen on cross. Janet, if there's ever a trial for Madeline Soto, will you cover it? It's so twisted, I understand if you won't. Honestly, I don't know much about it. I don't know much about it, so I can't answer that at this point. So that kind of catches us up um, to speed on day two of Ethan Crumbly's trial. I mean, of James Crumbly's trial. To me, it's a really, really interesting trial. It's very different from Jennifer Crumbly's, obviously different from Ethan Crumbly's. I do think they have more evidence against him than they do um, against Jennifer because he bought the firearm. He talked with him more about it. He specifically said, I asked my dad and told my dad certain things. Um, he was the one kind of in charge with securing the firearms in their house. So I do think that there is more here than against Jennifer Crumbly. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's a conviction. But I do think his lawyer is doing a better job, a more pointed, different defense, not, you know, hyper vigilant parent and we're all bad parents. But I, I do think that She's making some of the good points I was wanting to see in Jennifer Crumley's trial about the foreseeability, about what the parents actually knew, about what they really could have and should have done in the situation that they were in. So it's going to be really interesting to continue to watch what kind of points she picks and cross. She doesn't cross a lot of witnesses, which I think is smart as well. The ones that kind of give the background of what happened that horrific day. Francis, what's a leading question? It's basically putting the answer in the witness's mouth. You didn't go there, right? You put up those lights the way that you did, right? You painted that wall gray, didn't you? Now, did did you do something as appropriate? There's some gray area. Did you ever go over there? Yes or no questions are not always leading. Did you go over there? No, I didn't. Did you do this? If you don't really know what the answer is based on the question, if you're not inferring an answer, then it's appropriate. But if you say, you put the camera on the tripod next, didn't you? That's inferring that they, in fact, put the tram put camera on the tripod. Were you the one that put the camera on the tripod? Not leading. There's some nuance to it, but you you can hear it, especially lawyers and judges. They can usually pick it out when they see it. They don't always agree, but it's it's putting the answer in the witness's mouth. Um, I go, why do we not see more cases of one lawyer being a stickler for, pro, uh, for properness and objecting consistently when the other side leads improperly, et cetera? Are they afraid of being annoying the judge and jury? Yes, not afraid, but somebody, you definitely don't want to annoy the jury, number one. Number two, maybe you don't think the questions are hurting you. So it's like, go ahead, lead all day because those questions and answers are all good for me. So there are different reasons on strategy of why not to object or when to object. Lawyer, you know, hey, Jude. Hey, Jude. Uh, what is this about James threatening witnesses by way of the jail phone or computer? So we don't know specifically what it is, but there are allegations that there was some kind of threat from communication from the jail, which has now limited his communication. PIDs, I can't see a conviction yet. If I were a juror, I would have serious doubts. Well, it's early, so hopefully nobody's thinking conviction just yet. So I saw some of this from John in the uh, 
chat hanging on. I'm faring okay. I don't know if something happened, John, but hopefully things are okay over there. Azam, thank you so much for the super sticker. I appreciate you guys um, so much for all joining me. River said, are you going to cover Brian Koberger when it comes? You know it. We've been covering it. We've got a playlist for that entire case um, if you want to check it out. So I appreciate you guys so much for joining us. This was interesting as well. It was an interesting day. Each day, I'm going to try to pick out the lawyering, some of the arguments, each question, or I mean, each um, side is trying to make. We're not going to get into the gory details of the day. We all know the brutal, horribly sad day it was when Ethan Crumbly showed up um, to commit those crimes. So I appreciate you guys for joining me. I appreciate you guys for being here. Make sure you hit that like button if you haven't already. It helps out these videos with the YouTube algorithm. And make sure you subscribe and tell anybody watching this case to come check out the channel. Come check out the recap so we can get their input, answer their questions. I appreciate you guys as always. But for now, I'm out of here. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. And don't forget to check out The Lawyer You Know podcast with new seasons dropping every quarter. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tragos, The Lawyer You Know.